Good afternoon. In 1984, I was two years old, and my family decided to immigrate all the way from India to the United States. When we got here, my dad enrolled in a master's program for electrical engineering. Given that my parents were immigrants, they couldn't afford things like childcare, so I followed my dad to a number of his lectures. As he was studying electrical circuits, I would sit on the floor of his lectures and rifle through his books, looking at the funny squiggly diagrams. I didn't know what any of it meant. I could barely read at the time. But that was my introduction to engineering. After my dad finished his degree, he graduated and took a job in a semiconductor company. He would come home and say things like, I've had a really long day of making chips and wafers. And I was thinking, yummy. <laughs> and I always wondered why my dad never brought home one of these chips and wafers. <laughs> a few years later, I would have my golden opportunity. My dad would come home one day and ask me, would you like to go to a fab? And I looked at him and I said, what's a fab? And he said, oh, it's a fabrication facility. It's where they make chips and wafers. And I thought, of course, <laughs> because maybe I'd get to see how they're made, but I'd most likely be able to try one of these chips and wafers. On the day that my dad and I were getting ready to go to the fab, he said that I couldn't touch anything because the oils from my hands would contaminate the chips and wafers. So I nodded that I wouldn't. We entered the fab. It was an all-white room. And in the very center of the room was a small glass box. I walked up to the box, and I noticed that there was a very, very small robotic arm that was precisely picking up one chip at a time and moving it to the other side. Of course, I didn't know it was a chip. I just thought it was a small black square. But in that moment, I became so mesmerized by the precision of this robotic arm that I completely forgot why I was there to try a chip and wafer. Somehow that day I wasn't deterred by the fact that my dad didn't make chips but instead made microchips and that he didn't make wafers but he made silicon wafers. Instead I learned that these were the products that he was making and that it resulted in building technology. In fact this inspired me to get more interested in technology and I started to do things like taking the time to tinker. I would do simple things around the house, like program the VCR, assemble the vacuum cleaner, even take apart the computer just to see what was on the inside. I was fortunate that I came from a family of a lot of engineers. They didn't mind that I was constantly breaking and fixing things. They encouraged this kind of behavior. And eventually it would lead me to pursuing degrees in electrical engineering and computer science. After graduation, I decided to move all the way out to Silicon Valley. And soon enough, I was lured into startup land, where I began as the founding engineer of Mint.com. Mint is a personal finance website that lets you see your complete financial picture in one place. After Mint was acquired, I decided that it was time to strike out on my own and become an entrepreneur. So I started by building BusyBee. BusyBee is a software solution for small businesses. We make it super simple for folks like yoga studio owners to keep track of their customers. And most recently, I decided to take my seven-year-old blog about engineering and entrepreneurship and turn that into a business. Femgineer is an education company where we teach people how to build products and companies. I know what you're thinking. It's really easy for someone like me, who's been tinkering since I was a kid, has a professional background, lives in Silicon Valley, to build all these products and companies. The truth, though, is that there have been a lot of tinkerers throughout time who have been less fortunate and less privileged and come from even more humble beginnings than myself. One great example are the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers 
came from very humble beginnings. And like myself, they had a family that encouraged them to pursue their intellectual interests. And they started out pretty simply. Ola Wright's favorite hobby growing up as a kid was making kites. It wasn't until one day when his dad brought home a toy helicopter. Now this was you know, back in the day, so it wasn't mechanized or anything. The toy helicopter was just made from a top and some rubber bands. But upon seeing this, him and his brother Wilbur, much like myself seeing that robot in the fab, became enamored and were immediately inspired to get interested in aviation and aeronautics. As the Wright brothers grew up, they continued to have this interest, but they still had those humble beginnings. They didn't get past high school and went on to become bike mechanics, but that didn't stop them. They were still inspired, they were still intrigued, and wanted to figure out if human flight was possible. So they started iterating. This was one of their first prototypes. It's just a glider. But from this, they knew that they could get things off the ground. They also went on to do simple things like studied how birds would tilt their wings. This is known as wing warping. They incorporated this into their design. They also learned about the movable rudder, incorporated that. And then they took a look at all the designs of failed professional engineers and thought if they just had a better design, human flight would be possible. Well, we know what happened, right? That one day in Kitty Hawk, where the Wright brothers did make human flight possible. They were the first to make that happen. Even the location Kitty Hawk was pretty instrumental. Kitty Hawk has a lot of wind. Orwell must have been inspired from all those days of building kites to know that you need a lot of wind to get something off the ground. And now we have the Wright brothers to thank from building simple kites to pioneering aviation and aeronautics. We can get from one place to the other pretty simply. Like the Wright brothers, there have been a number of tinkerers throughout time. And the reason that we herald these people is because their creativity has led to innovations. And those innovations have actually helped improve human life. A lot of them began naturally curious and had families that supported them and their efforts. And they also had childhoods where they were encouraged to tinker. Unfortunately today, many children aren't given that same level of encouragement. In fact, a lot of times they're ridiculed by their peers, being called things like nerd or geek. As a result, they internalize it put aside their tinkering, and decide that it's time to fit in. The worst offenders are actually adults, though, who oftentimes scold children, telling them not to touch this or play with that, or yelling at them if they break something. However, we shouldn't be yelling at kids if they break something. Instead, we need to encourage them that if they break it, they got to learn how to fix it. If we don't do this, then they'll grow up to feel like adults with limiting beliefs. They'll always feel like they're behind and not able to keep up with the changes in technology or even ways in which they can help innovate and make a difference. This feeling is only exacerbated by things like the 10,000 hours concept, which people know as having to invest 10,000 hours before you can master a skill or even a simple hobby. However, in his book Focus, Daniel Goleman says, you actually don't need 10,000 hours. What you really need is a consistent study. Even just a couple of hours a day can make a difference. The other ingredient is you need a mentor or a coach, someone who can help you when you get to those sticky points. They can show you how to get over those hurdles by pointing out some new methods or strategies. I know after saying all this, you might still feel like, don't have time, have other obligations, and you know, just not interested in tinkering. So I'm hoping that the story of Elaine Levin will inspire you to take some time to tinker. I met Elaine Levin a few months ago at a Femgineer Forum, an event that I hold in San Francisco and I'll be holding next week in New York City as well. Elaine is 63 years old, and in 1996, Elaine was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. 
Unfortunately, this disease has been pretty debilitating for Elaine. She can't even walk more than 90, 20 minutes before she gets tired. She has to sit down. Now, she could use something like a walker to help encourage her to play, but the walker's instability has actually caused Elaine to feel like she can't make any progress. Uh, in addition to that, Elaine's not alone. There are actually 25,000 people who are injured yearly who fear falling and actually experience that. As a result of this, they're reluctant to use the walker. They're reluctant to live a full life. They're reluctant to play. Elaine decided that she had had enough. She didn't want to live out the rest of her life in, with this chronic condition. So she came up with an idea. In 2009, she had a conference that she went to in Portland. And she decided that she wanted to make a new walker. Then, after she went to the conference, she posted her idea on Planet Eureka. A few days later, an industrial design engineer named Robert Porter found her walker. Upon finding it, he emailed her and said, hey, I'd like to send you something. So he sent her a special wheel. Once she got this wheel, she was instantly interested. And from that point on, the two of them worked together. In 2010, she was, rewar she was rewarded a patent for her new walker. This is Elaine's walker. It's called the Podna Rover. And what you'll notice here is that stability wheel in the front. This gives people a chance to use a walker and not feel like they're going to fall. Or as Lane calls it, mobility with confidence. By scratching her own itch and taking the time to tinker, Elaine has been able to get out and play. Now, as you're thinking about what you're going to do, don't fear that you have to change the world tomorrow. Think about how you can take baby steps. Even something as simple as scratching your own itch, like Elaine did. Or maybe even pursuing a simple hobby, like building kites, like the Wright brothers. You never know how your simple innovations and interactions and taking the time to tinker can help yourself and others lead a more rich and playful life. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> oh,